do a um, presentation about pesticide residue. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of the regulations that we find here in the U.S. and then also globally, um, how some of those systems came into place in those areas. Um, so I'll give you a brief history, and then I'll go through the regulations, so how those kind of came about, and then also how the MRLs are set in those countries, um, and hopefully a little bit of background information that can be useful for you. Um, so first of all, how the FAO um, describes or defines a pesticide, it's quite a long one there. Um, so any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, or controlling any pest, um, and so on and so on. So, and down at the bottom, they define a pest, although it may be those typical things that we think of, insects, arachnids, unwanted plants. Um, it actually is a bit broader than that. It includes vectors of human and animal disease, um, also unwanted animals, etc. So it, the definition of pesticide sometimes is a little more broad than what we think of it. Uh, most of the time we're thinking, you know, we're going to kill some insects, we're going to, you know, use some herbicides, insecticides, get rid of some unwanted plants. Um, so a lot of the discussion is revolved around that, but just keep in mind that in some cases it's much more broad than that. Just a brief history, and hopefully you can read that at least somewhat. Um, and I'm not going to go through every single square on there for time here. Uh, just to show kind of the long history of pesticides, that general category. So as far back as um, 2500 BC, they realized that if they applied some chemicals, um, say sulfur, they could control insects um, as they were, as agriculture was developing into these row crops and things like that. Um, as they if you move up, you know, use of things like soaps as pesticides. Um, that seems, of course, but back then it was a big deal, right? Um, and eventually moving up into more modern day where they started applying things like arsenic and copper, sulfate, mixtures used to control pests, things that even now you think, oh my gosh, arsenic. Um, but <laughs> it worked, I guess. Um, and so then they started the development of um, application equipment. So not only were they applying the chemicals, but now they could apply them in large doses over large areas um, as the equipment um, to spray those chemicals on the crops came about. And that was actually around the same time they, not long after, they started looking at synthetic pesticides. Before this, it was just various maybe inorganic sort of chemicals that happened to have a response that could control insects. Um, and so DDT, right here, uh, so Paul Mueller, Mueller um, got a Nobel Prize in medicine um, for that compound, actually. So it was used for controlling mites on soldiers to help control typhus. So um, obviously then it was used as an application to control insects and crops, um, but that's where it started. Um, and not long after that, as we start seeing the wider use of those synthetic pesticides, we also start to realize that there's some issues with um, that large um, broad application as they were used. Um, and so USD established the IPM, or Integrated Pest Management Program, um, and we start to see the targeting of more specific pesticides that um, are targeting specific crops, specific insects, versus the broad spectrum where you just spray it and hope you kill everything but that one thing that you want to grow. So a big challenge for manufacturers selling either raw commodities or processed food products is meeting then the requirements for your customers um, to not have some of those residues. And so even though you may not be the applicator of those residues, you have to make sure that they're not in your products at that final stage when you're selling it. Um, and the regulations for all those MRLs between countries are not necessarily the same. Uh, there is the Codex Committee, um, if you're familiar with that. They are an international organization that does set some limits for different residues, including pesticides and other pesticides. Um, and they do meet together, they set MRLs. Any of the member countries of the Codex can give input on those um, levels and either accept um, or you know, give dissension if they would not agree with that MRL um, and adopt those proposed MRLs, and some countries do. Um, unfortunately, um, many of those Codex um, levels are recommendations. They don't, as a member, you don't have to follow them, and many countries choose to set their own MRLs. Um, and so the result is there's 
Thousands and thousands of MRLs out there, depending on what country you're looking at, they may not be the same. Um, so I'm going to go through here first with the U.S. So to start at the beginning, if you're going to register a pesticide for use in the United States, it's going to get reviewed by the EPA. Um, they review all registrants. Um, they do well over 100 studies that look at the um, not just efficacy, but also the safety, um, both environmental and also in terms of toxicology of those chemicals. The estimated cost of registration is upwards, most recently that I saw, $250 million. Um, it can take nine to 10 years. And that would be just for the registration phase. There's obviously a development phase far before that, um, just like a pharmaceutical you know, product. So it's, it's a very long process. It's a very expensive process. Um, and so we see many chemicals have been reduced, I guess, in terms of what's in the pipeline um, and the types of um, chemicals that are in the pipeline have changed a little bit too. So you know, we're going away from the broad spectrum, you know, the good old amount of rain, um, you know, spray, you know, your needs, and it's become much more um, specific um, in the activities of the chemicals that we're spraying. So in 1938, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, so that was the um, really initiating um, where FDA was setting tolerances then for what those chemicals were getting into the food. Uh, and then there's FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, um, where EPA then was given the actual authority to set the tolerances in the raw egg products. Um, during those studies that they do, of course, they're going to do, again, environmental studies, they're going to do feeding studies, and so they have data on what is safe. Um, and in 1996, they also then enacted the Food Quality Program Protection Act, um, and so that really codified, so at that point, um, so EPA is covering all the registration, right? So the chemical manufacturers are going through the EPA to register their product, um, and then FDA is using tolerances found in those studies to then say we're going to use these MRLs in our food um, in terms of what we've decided is going to be acceptable or not. And so that um, act made that codified into the U.S. law. So EPA still has authority to enforce FIFRA um, in terms of getting registration and the sale of those pesticides. Um, generally that's actually done by individual states, so you have state inspectors that will go out um, they do inspections of where it's manufactured, they do inspections of where it's sold, they'll take samples, check make sure you know, what's in the bottle is what it's supposed to be. Enforcement of tolerances in food, um, again, of course, will still be the FDA, um, and that's under Section 402, the FFDCA. Um, any ag product or processed food product considered adulterated, if they find it to be above the MRL that they have set, or if they find a tolerance or a residue that they don't currently have a tolerance for. So if it's a chemical that they haven't set a tolerance for, so actually it's not registered, um, it's also considered adulterated. And imported food must also meet all the same requirements as the domestic food. Uh, they do allow for some exceptions for unavoidable residues, and that's kind of an odd category um, to say it's unavoidable, but um, there are some exceptions that depending on the situation, if the chemicals persisted in the environment, you can show that there would be movements there. So the um, MRLs are set by the EPA again, um, and you can find them in the electronic code of um, federal regulations. They also have a database, the International MRL Database, and I've used this quite a lot myself. Um, it's actually really quite useful. Um, so I took a screenshot there of what it kind of like they actually recently just revamped it a little bit, um, so it's a little bit different if you've ever used it in the past. Um, so you can get a login, it's not, there's no cost associated with that. They have some additional tools that you can get at a cost, but just the general access, there's no cost for it. Um, so you can see on the tab there, there's the pesticide tab, and um, of course, the main, I guess, tool that it has is that you can search library for pesticide residues in specific quantities and specific, oh, me, uh, specific markets. So you can say, I'm going to be looking at the EU, and I want to see what MRLs 
are required for corn, let's say, um, or corn coming from some other country if I'm importing into the U.S., I can look at their market and see what's required. Um, another um, aspect of the database that they have is they have a little tab that's called Market Info, and you can actually pull up um, information on a specific uh, market. So if you're looking for a product that you're going to move into maybe a market that you're not used to, you're going to go to Algeria, let's say. Uh, you can look up them in the table, um, and they're going to have some basic info. They'll tell you, well, do they use codex? Um, there's a number of countries that will defer to the codex requirements. Um, or do they set their own MRL? So if you were to look at the EU, they're going to give an explanation um, of what they, how the EU sets their MRLs and what they, how you can access 